Well, good morning. How are we? Are we doing well? Happy New Year. I'm Scottish, so this is a big deal for me. We love New Year and we celebrate New Year. So Happy New Year to everyone this morning. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is this image that's going to come up on the screen. And if I was to give it a title, it would be NBC News 2014. And the headline would be Connecticut family plunged to their death in Sleeping Giant State Park. Now, what do I mean by that? That sounds terrible. It's a picture of my family, okay? So let me tell you the backstory to that image that's going to come up. It's 2014. We had just moved to Connecticut about two or three years previously. And we wanted to go hiking. We wanted to take our kids on a hike. Our kids at that time were two and five years old. And so we went to Sleeping Giant. It was the closest one. We lived in Hamden at the time. And so we went to Sleeping Giant. And as we started to walk, we, like, we had our backpacks full. We had our drinks and our snacks. But honestly, we were just kind of, kind of like, hey, it's fine. We know what we're doing. We'll just go hiking. We pretty much ignored the big sign that told you which paths were good paths, which trails were bad trails, if you have young kids. We just found a trail. It looked like lots of people had walked it. So we thought, let's just walk this trail. So off we went. And for about the first 30 minutes, it was actually okay. As we climbed up through the trees, we could see more and more of Connecticut. And our kids were loving the hike. And everything was going really well. And we sat down and we took a picture. This was, you know, this selfie. We took the family selfie. Look, here we are on our hike. And we kept on walking. And then it happened. We literally walked to this one point, And it was like a cliff, like a 40-foot cliff. And we're like, wait, what? But you could see the trail kept on going at the bottom of the cliff. And we're like, wait, wait, what? So we started the dialogue. Do, do, we, try, do we have to climb down this? We have a two-year-old and a five-year-old right here. Are we going to die? And so we debated, like, there we are. Now, my son in the front row is mortified because he's now 13. And he's like, get that picture off the screen, right? But there we were, and we're like, this is the image that's going to be NBC Connecticut tonight. Like, do we, do we go down? Do we, but we've walked so far. Do we go back? I don't want to go back. I want to keep walking forward. Side note, we turned and walked back because we did not want to be that NBC Connecticut story that night. But you see, when we started on that path and that trail, it looked great. And everyone had walked it. It was well worn. But we pretty much ignored the sign that told us, this is not the trail for you. You should try another trail. You know, I think we're all walking paths every day or trails. And as we come into a new year, some of us are walking paths of doubt. Some of us are walking paths of questioning faith. Some of us are walking paths or trails where we're questioning and doubting our marriage. Some of us are walking paths and wondering, is this relationship going to go anywhere? Are we going to get married? Or some of you might be thinking, are we going to get divorced? Some of us are walking paths and we think, is this the right career for me? What am I doing? You see, at the start of the year is often a time of reflection. When we look back, but we also look forward. And that day we were walking a physical path, but all of us, I think, every day were walking paths. In our relationships, in our career, in our families. But at the heart of it is are we walking the path with God? Are we walking the path with God? But we're all walking paths every day. And this morning we're going to look at Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 is a beautiful psalm because it lays before us two paths. It says there are two ways you can walk. And the psalm as we see it, the first path, well, lots of people are walking that path. It's well-worn. It seems popular. It seems like the one we should walk. There's lots of people on it. Lots of our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors, our family members are walking this path. But there's another path we're going to see in Psalm 1. And this path seems way less popular. And a lot less people seem to walk it. And sometimes, in fact, it feels like we're the only person walking that path. 
And that path seems to be one of obedience and surrender and trust and faith. And let's be honest, none of us really like to hear that because the other path seems to be the popular path, the cool kids path, the one that everyone else is walking. But you see, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Our paths end up somewhere. They don't just keep on going. They end at a point. And the question for you and me this morning is, where does our path take us? Where does that path lead us? Where do we end up if we keep walking down that path this morning? So let's read Psalm 1 together at the start of a new year. When some of us are walking paths of doubt or questioning or uncertainty or anxiety or stress or whatever. In relationships, in family, in friends, in career, whatever it might be, let's see what this psalm speaks to you and me this morning. So let's follow on as we read Psalm 1 together. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand at the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Father, this morning at the start of a new year, we come to these words of Psalm 1. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us this morning. Breath of God, would you breathe life into us today, that these words would be life to our soul. So we choose to surrender our ears, our heart to you this morning. And would you come and speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So two paths in this psalm, two paths. So let's start with the popular one. I called it the popular path. Let's start with that path. Now this psalm, like so many of the psalms, is full of such beautiful imagery. The writer is painting a picture with his words. And so what do we see? Well, it's interesting. He uses three different words to describe how we can walk down the popular path. It starts with, so we can follow, then we can stand, and then we can sit. Now think about that for a moment. If I'm following a line of people, I'm in motion, I'm moving. If I stand and turn the other way, it's a bit awkward, but everyone's walking, I'm just walking the other way. But you see, if I'm standing in a circle with people, and we're all standing together, and I choose to step away from that circle, that's a little bit more awkward. That's a little bit more obvious because we're all standing. And I suddenly decide to move away. That, that takes a bit more effort. But the final one is I'm sitting. We're all sitting together. And that's way more awkward and way more obvious. If I stand up and walk away, I'm like, what are you doing, dude? We're just sitting together. You see, the psalmist is trying to say something to us. The more you walk down the popular path, the harder it is to turn and walk back. Because you get yourself to a point where you stand with everyone and then you sit down. And let's be honest, I'm turning 50 this year. Standing up's a bit harder at my age. Just saying. So the psalmist is trying to give us a bit of a warning. Hey, the more you walk down this path, the harder it's going to be for you to turn and walk back up. So we see that to begin with in this psalm. The psalmist is telling us something about what happens when we walk down this path. But here's the, the key. It says that we follow those who go before us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't follow someone if I don't want to. I don't follow someone if I'm like, I don't want to go there. And the psalmist is saying we follow, we choose to follow those who go before us. It's a choice we've made. They're calling us, hey, come on this way. Come on, be with the cool kids. Come on down this path. 
It's attractive and it's alluring. We don't go down it because we're like, oh, here I go to destruction. That's not what we're thinking. We wouldn't walk down a path if the sign said, this way to destruction. Oh, that sounds great. Let me go down this path. We would never walk down a path if it said, this way to destruction. Yet we see in the psalm, that's how it ends. The psalmist says the wicked end in destruction. But it's not painted that way because no one would walk down it. It's attractive. It's alluring. And there's so many people already walking that way. Friends, colleagues, neighbors, family members. So why don't I just join them? Because everybody's going this way. Now the psalmist not only describes what happens when we walk down, he tells us about the people that are already on that path. He says, they're the wicked. They're the sinners. They're the scoffers. Now again, that's like, oh, those sound like nice people. Let me go and join them. No, I don't want to be with the wicked, the sinner, and the scoffer. So the question becomes, but why do we walk down that path then? If it leads to destruction, and it's really hard to turn the further we get down, and it's full of the wicked, the sinner, and the scoffer, why do we go? Because it's attractive. Because you see, the sinner, the scoffer, and the wicked are saying things like, hey, this is the path to freedom. This is the path where you get to decide your life. This is a path that frees you from religion. This is a path that frees you from the shackles of that God. This is the path where you are the captain of your own ship. This is the path where you're in control of your life. You are independent. You are all you need. Now, doesn't that sound good? So why wouldn't I want to walk down this path? Because this sounds really attractive. It's not painted any other way than for your best benefit. You're told this is the best way to walk. But can I tell you something? I walked almost 20 years without Jesus and 30 years with Jesus. I've walked down that path. See, when you are your own chief cheerleader and you are your own moral compass and you're the only person that you can rely on, and you have to become your own God, can I respectfully say so much of the anxiety and stress that we bring in our life is because of this path? But we're told otherwise. So much of what we bear, because we have to bear every burden on this path, we have to bear the weight of everything that we carry when we walk this path. There's no respite, there's no relief because you are your own God. It's all on you. And so can you see when the psalmist says, the further you walk down this path, whoa, let me just stand for a minute. Oof. Let me just sit. Because this is really hard to carry. And I'm doing it on my own. But when you start the path, wow, it looks really attractive. And this is what we see. And how does the psalmist end the description of the wicked? He says they're like chaff, blowing in the wind. Blown about by whatever opinion or moral compass is there. They'll just follow anything. Because the only anchor they have is themselves. And he says, so you're like chaff. The wicked are like chaff, just blown on the wind. But then the psalmist does something else. He says, ah, but there's another path. Let's call it the less crowded one that goes this way. And what we hear so often in the Psalms is it's not the crowd or the multiples, it's the one. But I don't want to go this path because no one else seems to really be walking this path. This doesn't look like a nice path. There's not many people have trailed before me. I don't think I want to do this one. It seems like I'm going on it by myself. I want to follow the crowd. But this path's a different path. But as I said at the start, every path we walk on has an end point. This path, the end point is destruction. But it's not painted that way. But this path ends at a tree. Ends at a tree? I don't want to be a tree. But this is where it ends. 
Now, for you and for me, man, Connecticut, we got a lot of trees. Yep. Man, we got trees everywhere. But remember, for the Hebrew people, they lived in desert, semi-arid. There weren't many trees. And when you saw a tree, it gave you hope. It spoke of something was giving it life. This tree could not exist without water. It can't flourish without life and the life of water. So when you saw a tree, you were like, life, hope. And we see a tree in the first garden and we see a tree in the last garden. So this idea of tree was so comfortable to these people. And so when it says, when you walk this path, you're like a tree. Your end point is flourishing. It's life. It's hope. It's joy when you walk this path. So I don't know about you, when I hear that, I'm like, how do I walk that path then? Tell me how. I don't want to go this path. How do I walk this path? Well, the psalmist tells us, meditate on the law, day and night. Now I'm like, oh no, <sighs> may the God read scripture, oh, okay, let's make it a new year resolution. As Pastor Eli said, new me, it's new year, new me, I'm going to read scripture every day. That sounds like fun. <sighs> I got to meditate on scripture? Now here's the problem for you and me. You see, we say what it says, study the law or meditate the law in verse 3. We're like, oh, okay, that, all right, I'll get up at 4 a.m. I'll sit in a chair for five minutes, try and read the Bible. That's not what the word meditate means here in the Hebrew. Hebrew words are rich in pictures. And the word that's used, this word meditate, it's talking about a lion with a bone. What? Now, when a lion growls, I'm like, back away, walk away. But the image that's given is when a lion has a bone, it will growl over that bone. Not in anger, but actually in pleasure. It's growling because it's enjoying something. It's taking its time. It's chewing that bone. It's getting the marrow. It's actually a sign of pleasure. It's enjoying what it's eating. And so when the psalmist says, meditate on the words... It's not a case of, so you have to sit down, you have to read that scripture for 10 minutes every morning. What the psalmist is saying is, when you sit with the words, enjoy them. Chew on them. Meditate on them. Don't rush through them. Well, uh, okay, this Bible has 2,200 words. There's 365 days in the year. I have to read six pages a day. So at the end of the year, I can boast I read my Bible in a year. No, the psalmist is saying, when you get in, Sit with the words. And if you come across something that disturbs you, ask God why. And if you come across something that encourages you, ask God why. And if you come across something that convicts you, ask God why. But chew and chew and chew on the words. So for me, that does mean I get up early. And I'm British, so it's a nice big cup of tea. And I sit in that chair in my living room. And I get out of those words and I sit and breathe for a couple of minutes in silence because the world is rushing. And then I take up those words and I say, Lord, I want to read this number of pages today, but if you stop me, that's okay. And if I come across something that convicts me or encourages me or disturbs me, that's okay. Because I want to chew in your words. I want to meditate in your words. I want to have this, not as me reading your words, but you speaking to me through those words. Amen. So when the psalmist says meditate, he's saying, just enjoy them and take your time. There's been times in my life when I have struggled with anxiety. And when I've chosen to come and chew in those words, I think of scripture that tells me to be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer and supplication make my request known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will what? Guard my heart and mind. Just reading it would not have given me that scripture but I chewed on it and I memorized it and I thought about it and I spoke to God about it and it's now deep in my soul. 
on those moments when we are struggling, when it seems hopeless and everything seems black, but we choose to sit and meditate and think about the words and meet with God in Scripture. And he speaks to us the stories of Joseph when everything seemed hopeless, but yet there was hope. Or so many biblical stories where it seemed like the end was there and then in came God. I wasn't rushing. I sat and I chewed on the words. And I flourished. And my soul prospered. This psalm gives us a warning though. Because I sometimes think we think, well, I'll take this path or that path, but I won't walk, walk both. But the psalmist is given as a warning. Your heart will want to walk this path this day and this path this day. There's an old poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. You may have read it in school. Yep. And here's the very last verse of that poem. Listen to this, it says, I shall, shall be telling with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And we think, yes, he took our path. But look at the first line, and I with what? A sigh. You see, the psalmist knows our human condition. We want to walk both paths, don't we? I want to walk this path and flourish. Ah, but this one's the one that everyone's walking down, and it's really attractive, and I'm my own boss, and I'm the king of my own life, and I'm my own God, and that sounds good to me. And this path, this is a path of surrender and faithfulness and trust. And that doesn't always give me the warm fuzzy of this path. The psalmist knows our heart. He says, I need to warn you. Both paths have an end. And this one will end in destruction. And this one will end in life. How does that sound? At the heart of this psalm is a choice. A choice for you and for me every day. Every day. Do we choose this path or this path. Now you may be thinking, I have walked down this path so far, I can't walk back. That is a lie. Dismiss it. It's not truth. The truth is, no matter how far you've walked down this path, in doubt, in relationships, in questioning, in whatever it might be, you can get up and walk back this way. Anything else is a lie. Dismiss it in Jesus' name. But every day we have this choice. We won't stumble into this path. We will stumble into this path. We don't naturally lean into this path. But we naturally lean into this path. There's a really old movie called Casablanca. It was made in 1942. Right in the middle of World War II. And there's one scene in it where the occupying Nazis are in a bar and they start singing a song, Nazi songs. And all the people who are French realize this is, you know, they're occupied land, they're being occupied by the Nazis. And they sit there and then one of them stands up and starts to sing La Marseillaise, the French national anthem. Complete violation of the occupiers, the oppressors. And others begin to stand and sing it as well. But the pianist doesn't know what to do. Does he join in? Does he not? And so he looks at the bar owner, and the bar owner nods, and the pianist begins to play La Marseille. The pianist had to make a choice. Do I do this or not? You will not naturally choose this path. Sorry, this path. You will naturally choose this path because it is our human condition and human nature to go this way. But when we stand here and every morning say, God, I need you. I surrender to you this day. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me that I may flourish like a tree. 
and prosper in my soul as the righteous, as you have called me to do. It won't happen naturally, but it will when we surrender to the spirit of the living God. So what do we do this morning? Psalm 1 was like that big sign when we walked that trail. If only we had stopped and read it, we would have realized the path we were going on was all wrong. You see, because Psalm 1 is the invitation to walk the trail of the Psalms. To walk the trail of every one of those 150 Psalms. Psalms that will speak to the paths you're walking on. Paths of doubt, it's in there. Paths of questioning, it's in there. Paths of hopelessness, it's in there. Paths of fear and anxiety and stress and joy and jubilation. And as we read Psalm 150 this morning in our meeting before the start of church, of hope in, in the heights of God. But Psalm 1 is your invitation. Will you walk down the trail of the Psalms that your soul will flourish today? that your soul will prosper. That is the invitation before each of us this morning as we enter a new year. So we're going to close this morning by reading Psalm 1 again. Now, when I was young a long time ago and a new song came out, man, the first thing I did if I liked that song was what I learned every word of that song. We see the Psalms, these poems, were the songs of the Hebrew people. They were the songs of the first church. Can I tell you, Jesus sang these songs. The choice you have today is will you join that chorus? Will you sing the songs of the Psalms in 23? Because the promise of the psalmist is this. When you sing those songs, when you memorize them, when you chew on them, when you meditate on them and they get into your soul, you walk the path of the righteous. Not many walk it. Sometimes it can feel lonely. But my, my, your soul will prosper. And you will flourish with Jesus. Because he will be your life and the water of your soul. Amen. So my challenge to you this year, as you read this psalm is, read all the psalms. Memorize them. Except 119, very long. But learn them, sing them, and let them soak into your soul. So let's read this psalm in closing today once more. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Which yields its fruit in season. And whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff. That the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, we just stop at this psalm and we see it as the sign, the invitation, the entryway to all the rest of the psalms. And Father, we see this morning that we have a choice how we live. And we acknowledge that in our own strength, we can't do any of it. We need you. So in your grace and mercy, would you give us what we need to walk the path of the righteous? And we know that to walk that path, we just need to spend time with you. Where we sit and chew on your words, meditate on them, and allow you to speak to us. And in so doing, that living water that we hear of in John is poured out upon us and fills us as you fill us up. And we flourish and prosper in you, Jesus. So we surrender it all to you. Now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, 
If this is a conscious decision you're making for the start of 23, Lord, let me walk the path of the righteous. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, would you just look up and make eye contact with me? If that is a decision you choose to make this year, Amen. Father, help us to settle our hearts to know that we can't do this ourselves. There's no human effort, human ability involved. It's the choice to surrender to you, Spirit of the living God. That you would walk us in this path and you would cause our souls to flourish. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.